Yes, great, great. So, um, droid autopsy. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a forensic investigator, so I, I guess I'm a, I have a little bit different talk than most talks today and tomorrow. Uh, this is not about, really about hacking. Uh, this is more about the investigation uh, on a device, in this case, Android devices. Uh, me and my team, we, uh, we worked on the, the uh, Digital Forensics Research Workshop Challenge uh, last year. It's a really cool challenge. Uh, if anyone is interested in this area, I can really advise to join uh, this year or next year. Um, it was about an investigation on two Android devices. And today I want to take you through the challenge, how we solved it. Um, it's partly about the challenge itself, but also about uh, the interesting aspects of investigations on Android devices uh, that it touches. So um, I have probably way too many slides today. Um, uh, I'm, I'll try to make pace to get it all put into an hour. So I hope that's going to work. Um, well, anyway, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to raise your hand. Or uh, at the end, there's maybe room for questions, I hope. So let's get started. So the challenge starts like, like this. Um, there is a suspicious death. Uh, the guy named Don Norby, I'll refer to him as that guy because that's easier for the rest of the talk. And my experience is that referring to it as that guy is better for the association in the story. So, um, well, he's found dead with a bullet in the head and beside him lays an Android 2.1 phone. And the question is, what happened here? Is this a suicide or did something else happen? And there's another case at the same time um, at a company called Swift Logic, uh, where the people, um, uh, they all they experienced a data breach. And one of the employees, Job Tal, I call it the Swift, Swift Logic dude, he is, uh, well, they have reasons to believe that he is involved. And he would maybe have leaked the data through his Android phone. So he willingly gives his phone for investigations. Now, that's the start of the case, and now the question is, is this guy guilty of data leakage, or did something else happen? Well, the first thing you do when you get an Android phone as an investigator is you want to perform the data acquisition. So you want to get the data out in a forensically sound manner. Um, well, what are the interesting uh, storage areas in a smartphone, in an Android phone? Uh, the memory card is one thing, of course. Um, the other main thing is the internal storage. And, um, well, in most smartphones today, that's NAND flash storage. And it has multiple partitions. Um, well, Android phones, the most inter the interesting partitions are, in this case, the cache partition and the user data partition where the user data is stored. So, uh, this was actually already done at the start of the challenge, so they delivered us the images um, which they would have acquired in a forensically sound manner. They did describe how they acquired it. Well, for the first case, for that guy's phone, uh, they rooted the device and they used the well-known method, DD, to just uh, make a data dump of um, the MTD block device. Because, um, as most of you probably know, the Android is just based on Linux, and the NAND flash is represented as an MTD block device in the Linux subsystem. So uh, they dumped the data of the block device uh, using DD to uh, an image file on the memory card. Later, they pulled the memory card out, and they just copied the image to an analysis system. Um, this is not a really good thing because um, if you use DD on MTD devices and you use it on the block layer, you forget to take with you the out-of-band bytes of a flash memory. I'll get to that a little further in the presentation, what the out-of-band bytes exactly, uh, why you need them. But this is one important failure in the acquisition phase. Now, for the second, the Swift Logic dude, they rooted the device and they used the correct method, uh, and that is NAND dump. Uh, NAND dump, actually, you dump all the bytes from an MTD device, and uh, you do it from the MTD device directly, so not from the MTD block, which uh, causes you to take with you the out of band bytes also. And they, in this case, they actually transferred it. 
um, over the debugging port to the system and they wrote it there to an image file. So uh, the result is we got delivered a lot of images for each partition on the phone. We get an image. Um, we focused our investigations on the memory card, on the user data partition, because that is the partition where the user data is stored. The cache partition is a partition that is used to temporarily store stuff, like, uh, for example, if you visit web pages, uh, caching is stored there. Um, there's also a system partition. Uh, we didn't really investigate the system partition, but it can be interesting in other investigations. For example, if you want to investigate uh, more advanced forms of malware, which may alter uh, stuff on the system partition, which was not the case in this challenge. So we skipped that. We focused on the user data partition and the memory card. So where do you start? Well, um, we have a lot of tools in the forensic investigation area. Um, they're maybe not so known to you, but NCASE and Forensic Toolkit are the most known tools, which are actually just really big software packages that you can put in an image and it will decode it for you and index it for you. And they have, you have all kinds of cool features which you can directly use. Um, these work on images with known file systems. Uh, the SD card, the memory card, is imaged, is uh, formatted as FOP32. So that's a known file system. We could analyze, we did analyze the SD card with the known toolkits. We got a lot of information from there in this phase. Um, we used carving methods to, uh, to carve out information from the internal uh, partitions which were not formatted with a known file system. They were formatted YAFS2. I'll come to that later. But uh, if you don't know the format of the file system, you can still use carving techniques to try to carve out known files based on the file signatures. So we use the traditional file carving tools like Scalpel and Photorec to uh, try to get the most out of the raw images, see if we can get any useful data out of that. That didn't go so well, and we'll get to that later, too. Um, what we did get, find on the dead guy's device, um, on the SD card, uh, you see that there are PDF files stored in the download folder. Well, the download folder is, as you would have guessed, the folder where uh, files get stored uh, when you download them from a web page. But they contain uh, schematics of Swift logic. And that's interesting because uh, what has the dead guy got to do with Swift logic? So this was the first hint that these cases are connected. Um, so there's Swift logic schematic files on the phone of the dead guy. Um, we also carved for HTML files. HTML files are nice files to carve to because you can pretty much, based on the markers in HTML files, uh, carve out really nice complete files. And we found uh, this particularly interesting uh, page. This was found in the cache partition. This appears to be uh, a directory listing from an Apache web server. The nice thing is we, uh, we can see the IP address. So apparently, the dead guy visited an Apache their listing um, at the specified IP address in the directory SS and saw there nine PDF files. Um, and this, of course, matches with the PDF files we found in the download folder. So that would make sense. He visits this page, um, downloads each of these PDF files. They get stored in the download folder. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't reach the HTML page yeah, live was protected by an HD access mechanism, and uh, we had to keep it real, so uh, hacking the page was not allowed. Um, so so that's, uh, that's an interesting finding. Um, so somehow, uh, PDF files from SwiftLogic got sent to this web server page and were downloaded by the dead guy. So those were the first findings we actually got without going to more advanced techniques where we used the traditional carving tools and the traditional forensic toolkit. 
uh, to get these findings. So we got a long way, but then there is still the internal memory formatted in JAFS, um, which keeps a lot of data to itself because we couldn't get to that data because the um, traditional carving tools don't really perform well and our toolkits don't understand the YAFS file system. So if you load it into the toolkit, you just see this big blob of data and it doesn't really reconstruct the file system so you can go through the directory and look at the files themselves. So um, even though our toolkits don't understand the YAFS file system, there are, of course, methods to uh, reconstruct the YAFS file system. You just need to put a little bit of work in that. So there are more ways to roam. Um, one is uh, you can use uh, forensic, mobile forensic toolkits, which are expensive. Um, so we wanted to keep it with methods which are free or either not too expensive, so this was not an option. You could use the Android emulator, uh, which actually also works with data images. Um, however, the Android emulator doesn't really like foreign images. You can just tell the emulator, okay, uh, create an Android 2.1 uh, device, and here are the user data image and the system image, because it will start complaining that it doesn't match with what, uh, what is, it actually has in its uh, boot image, for example. So that needs some tweaking before you got it to work. The easiest method was to just load the YAFS2 support into our Linux kernel, because, like I said, the Android systems are just based on Linux, and they have the YAFS support. So it should be possible to just load it in. And it is, and it's not too hard. Um, well, the first thing you need to do is load some necessary kernel modules, the MTD, the MTD block, and uh, you need a NAND sim to simulate a NAND device in your Linux subsystem. Um, well, with, when you include the NAND sim module, you need to make sure you have the right parameters to create, to simulate a NAND device with the correct size and page size and array size. So this is one example we used. You can tweak it to create a NAND device of the right size. Well, then uh, we wrote the bytes from our image to the simulated NAND device. And here you have to mind that uh, with the image of um, the Swift logic guy, we did have the out-of-band bytes. And if you write it to a simulated NAND device, you should make sure that you write the out-of-band bytes, or else you still cannot reconstruct the YAFS file system. So use the right switches there. Uh, well, the last thing is to uh, download the YAFS2 package. It's out there. Um, and you can just uh, compile it and insert it into the kernel. And voila, there you go. So you mount it with YAFS2. And here you see the example of, uh, of a user data partition mounted. Now that we have a mounted device, so we actually reconstructed the file system, it's useful to start first searching through the files. We could have searched through the image, of course, but if you found some interesting strings in there, you still have to find the origin of the string. So what is that blob of data where I found that string actually representing? So now that we have reconstructed the file system, it's easy to search through it and see in which file a certain string belongs. So in this case, we found the IP address, um, which is interesting because that's the IP address of the web page we saw in the dead guy's phone. And we found that IP address on the SwiftLogic dude's phone. So that's interesting. What is that IP address doing there? We found it in a, um, in a Dolphic cache file. Um, Android, Android's packages, programs, applications run on a Dolphic virtual machine. And for each application, a cache file is created, which caches, for example, used strings. And um, we found it in a cache file 
of this application, com.enriad.mm. Right. Well, that's interesting. First, why is the IP address in there, and why is there a package named Enriad instead of Android? I don't know if that was uh, actually a mistake of the guys who created the challenge, or that it was somebody who just uh, thought, well, let's make it easier for them and make them recognize a file that's not supposed to be there. Okay, so we have a new lead. Let's find out what, is, um, what this application is com.enrio.mn actually is. Android keeps a listing of all installed applications. Whenever you install a package, uh, it's registered in an XML file and it registers certain information about it, like, for example, uh, under which user ID it runs, um, when it is installed. Now, that's interesting because we can see that it's installed on the 5th of May 2011. And I didn't include the whole timeline, um, but uh, 5th of May was the date when uh, uh, the Swift Logic dude actually bought his phone at the phone store. And uh, this package was installed just before he picked up the phone at the phone store. So that's an interesting find. What's more, what you see here is the permissions. Um, all Android application. All Android applications can only do what uh, they are permitted to do by what they define to be, need, uh, to be needed on permissions. So uh, uh, whenever you create an application, you would include a manifest file. We'll get to that later. Uh, and it lists the permissions, the, thing, the things the application would like to do. So uh, that's when you, when you install an application, you see the listing of Hey, you want to install this application, it uh, needs services that cost you money, or it needs an internet connection, and then when you click accept, it gets installed, and the permissions are listed in this packages.xml file. What we also see around the same time, just a minute before, there's an application called com.vw.sms uh, uh, provider, which is also installed. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Um, Especially when you look at, um, at the permissions, apparently this is an application that wants permission to send and receive text files, uh, text messages, sorry. Okay, so now we want to start analyzing the package, the application itself. Um, well, you can do a live analysis, so just get out the emulator, uh, get the package file, the application file, from your images and load it into the emulator and run it. Uh, now, the emulator allows you to monitor uh, certain activity in the emulator by, uh, for example, uh, watching log files for debug messages. You can use Wireshark to intercept uh, all internet communication that it uses and analyze it. Um, there's also a Dolphic debug monitor, which you can use to monitor the, uh, the activity of your application. So, for example, it's heap activity or uh, other things. Well, we mostly uh, relied on the static analysis. So, that's the nice thing about um, Android applications. It's that it's just, uh, well, a certain form of Java bytecode, which is uh, pretty well decompilable. Uh, in this case, especially because it was not obfuscated. So that's very nice if you decompile it, you can pretty much look through the source code as if it was the original source code. <clears throat> so um, you retrieve the, uh, the, the APKs, and the APK is the, the package file which is used by Android to, uh, for, for the application. So a package file actually contains uh, the classes uh, of the application, the actual bytecode. Uh, it also has a manifest file which actually tells the system okay, uh, this is the application, uh, this is the permission it uses, uh, it triggers on uh, these events, that sort of stuff. Um, you can get that Android manifest file out, but it's in binary XML, so you need to convert it first, and there are tools for that, for example, the APK tool, which you can use to convert it to a readable XML. So now we can read the Android manifest file and see, okay, what's the intention of this application? I will show you that in a minute. And um, there is the uh, Dolphic VM text file, which is actually a, uh, a set of class files. And the Dolphic VM operates a little bit differently than the 
regular Java virtual machine. So you need, if you want to analyze it, uh, convert it to a regular JAR file first. Uh, I use, use Dex2Jar for that. And the JAR file can be decompiled pretty well using, for example, JDGUI or any other Java decompiler. Okay, so this is um, the Android manifest file of the Unreal.mm. So what you see here in green is it states its permissions. So what does the application want to be able to do on the phone? Um, it wants uh, to be able to transfer and receive stuff over the internet. Uh, it wants to be able to read the phone state. Uh, the phone state, for example, is changed when uh, an incoming call is received or an incoming text message. When that happens, an event is fired and um, uh, it's able, now the application is able to actually read the phone state and say, hey, what happened to the phone? Oh, there's an incoming call. So it can react to that. Uh, a boot completed uh, event is received. So whenever somebody boots the phone, this application responds to it, it receives a trigger and can start doing things. <clears throat> and whenever an outgoing call is, is made, um, this, uh, this application can actually intercept the outgoing call and do whatever it wants with the event. Um, then there's the receivers, and those are actually the triggers. So when you develop an Android application, you, uh, you have an application actually trigger on certain events, and this application triggers on the uh, event uh, when the airplane mode is changed, uh, when the boot sequence is completed, and when the screen turns off. So then it activates and starts doing stuff. Um, and the interesting thing is in the bottom you see in red that it defines a service. Uh, normally when you create an ac application, usually use activities, which is just a screen that's get re that gets represented to the user. Uh, when you see a service in a Android manifest file, it's more like a background service that is run. So this application is actually never presented to the user, it just silently boots up on one of the events and starts running in the background. Oops, sorry about that. This is the Android manifest file of um, uh, the com dot, uh, that we provider, uh, SMS provider. Um, here you also see the receivers. There is also no activity, there's only a service, so also this application just runs in the background. And um, you see that the receiver, it receives intents uh, on action send and SMS received. So whenever um, somebody fires an event especially meant for this, uh, the event is named action send, this application wakes up and starts doing stuff. Uh, whenever an SMS is received on the phone, so the event is just broadcast through the phone, this application picks up the event and says, hey, there is an SMS received, I need to do something. <clears throat> so now when we look at the com.enreal file, we saw that it triggers on certain events, and you want to know, okay, what does it do when it triggers? What's it, what is it actually doing? And, uh, well, there's a lot of code. I just took out the relevant snippet from the code, and what you see here, see here is that it actually um, it gets the files from the external memory card. It creates its own zipper class, which is actually, when you look at the implementation of the class, it actually just sort of zips the files. And um, it stores the, the zip in a file called, called temp. And then it sends um, the file out, and you see the function send file which actually just sends it to the internet. And the interesting thing here is that we have an IP address, and that's the IP address we saw earlier. So apparently the files are zipped and sent to the uh, web server we saw. And you see also that when it has sent the file, that it sends a text message. And that function is actually implement implemented in the other package, the SMS provider package we saw. Um, here you can see that there's also a class in the SMS provider which triggers on a certain intent. Um, for example, um, the extra state ringing. That means, okay, whenever an incoming um, phone call is received, so the phone rings, this, activity this application wakes up, 
And what it does, it creates a string with call in and it puts in the number and uh, the date and time that the call is received and sends a message. And when you look at the send message, um, you can see that it actually just uh, uh, sends a text message. Well, it's maybe not clear, but it sends a text message to, here it is, to this phone number. And this is the phone number belonging to the phone of the dead guy. So this is, this is an interesting uh, uh, application because this is actually how um, Android malware, uh, how easy it can be created. Now this application was not available in the Android market. It was probably installed by somebody uh, in the phone shop. Um, but you see that all these functions are just regular system functions. The only thing that normally needs to happen is when a user installs it on his own phone, he just reads the permission, uh, permissions, and yeah, well, maybe you guys read the permissions, but I bet 80% of the people don't even look at the permissions and just say, okay, click through. Or you say, hey, this uh, application needs permission to, uh, to go on the internet, but we don't send any privacy information. Oh, okay, click and you install it. And for the rest, it just runs in the background and does its stuff. So in short, it, it, this is an, uh, a service, so it means it runs in the background. Um, it zips and transmits the data from the uh, memory card. It monitors for incoming calls, outgoing calls, and uh, sends text messages with the information to the phone number that belongs to the dead guy. So the phone was bugged. OK, so we actually got the case for the Swift Logic guy. We pretty much know how the information from his phone got sent to, well, apparently the dead guy's phone. But now you want to know from the dead guy, OK, what is his connection? Why is he interested in this? And remember that when we got the images from the dead guy's phone, they were corrupt. Uh, the out-of-band bytes were missing. Um, so we need some method to still investigate his phone images, but we can't just uh, reconstruct the file system. Now, before I get into how we did it, I want to tell something about the Jobs file system. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Jobs 2 file system? Mm. OK. <coughs> so this is a good slide, I guess. Um, well, it stands for yet another flash file system, version 2. Uh, it's a lock-structured file system, so um, that means instead of what you normally see with most file systems, uh, well, on hard disk storage devices, uh, you have sectors, and a file has certain sectors, and when something changes in the file, the change is actually written in the sector where it is changed, right? If you have NAND flash, um, you, most modern NAND flash devices don't allow to just update bytes uh, in an end flash page. So what you actually need to do is rewrite the page to a new uh, empty page with the update in it. Now flash, uh, Yoffs was made for NAND flash. So what they did is instead that changes are written in the page itself, it actually rewrites the page and append it after, appends it after the last written page. And I will show that in an illustration, just the next slide. Um, so data is never written in the same place, and it's strictly sequential. So within a block, each new uh, page write is written after the last written page. Um, well, this is, this is a, actually a very simple uh, concept. That's why it was used in Android phones, um, because it's relatively lightweight and effective. Um, however, it's single-threaded only. Um, and that was uh, good uh, until we had the dual cores and the quad cores, and then it becomes a problem. So now the newer devices have uh, uh, X4, I think, or X3 on, uh, on a flash transition layer. But until Android 2.2, uh, it was all Joffs 2. So uh, Yoff's concepts, which are important, we have objects. Yoff calls it an object, which can actually represent a file or a directory or a hard link. 
softlink or a device file, for example. Yoff speaks of chunks, and a chunk is, well, you could say it's a page in the NAND flash devices. It is possible if you have multiple parallel NAND flash devices that a chunk is uh, actually multiple pages, but for simplicity, we'll just refer to it as a page. And uh, it has blocks, like every NAND flash data is written in pages and uh, actually erased in blocks. And a block is, well, can, a, can be an arbitrary number um, from 32 to, say, 128 uh, pages. You have the object headers, which is actually a, a chunk containing the metadata of a file, so a timestamp, for example, or the file name, uh, permissions, that sort of stuff is stored in the object header, and you have a data chunk, uh, and the data chunks contain the actual data of the objects, say, the data of a file, for example. Okay, so how does it work? Uh, here we look at the simplified version of a NAND block. We see the pages. Um, in this case, on these devices we investigated, the pages were two kilobytes large. Um, they can be four or one or 512 bytes. And after each two kilobyte uh, chunk, there is the out-of-band bytes. And I think for this device it was 64 bytes. So each page, page has a small portion of out-of-band bytes. YOFS relies on the out-of-band bytes. It needs those, that section to store tags. And uh, the YOFS uses these tags to link the pages, the chunks, to each other and to the object. So what you see when a file is written, this is an example of a file which is two pages long. Um, you see two data chunks written and a object header. Now, these three are linked by the object ID, which is written as a tag in the out-of-band bytes. So uh, this is object ID 1, so it's the first file that is written. And the chunk ID um, is the identifier which tells you uh, which, uh, in a sequence, chunk of data it is in this object. So the object header has always chunk ID null, uh, 0. Uh, uh, the data, first data chunk has chunk ID 1, second has chunk ID 2. Now a second file is written, and you see that it's just appended in the next pages. Again, one data chunk is written, it's a very small file, and an object header is written. This has object ID 2, chunk ID 1, uh, and 0. So now say we change something in the first page of the first file with object ID uh, 1. Instead that the data uh, is written in the first page, the first page is rewritten right after the last written page, and the header is rewritten because the timestamp, for example, is changed or the size of the file is changed. This is all data that is stored in the object header, so that needs to be changed, so the page needs to be rewritten. And this is, this is actually a very uh, simple mechanism, and it's also very nice when you investigate flash devices because this means that a lot of history is stored on the device. You can imagine that if you write to hard disks that the actual sector is changed, that the old versions are harder to recover. Uh, in NAND flash, all the old versions exist, uh, will still be there until, of course, the whole block is erased to be reused. And that happens usually after a garbage collection. Um, fortunately, mobile devices are not very eager to start garbage collecting because it costs a lot of resource and makes your phone slow. So it will try to keep those blocks dirty and used as long as possible until it's really necessary to start cleaning it up, which is a good thing for, for a forensic investigator. OK, so um, yeah, get, that guy's phone is, uh, is, uh, is get, posing a challenge for us. We know how the OS file systems work, and um, we can't reconstruct this because we don't have the out-of-band bytes. All the interesting stuff um, is, is on the internal user data partition. Now you could say, okay, why don't you just use the traditional carving tools uh, like we did in the beginning? 
Well, there's a slight problem with that because all the interesting information is in SQLite databases. Um, Android stores, um, contact information, SMS messages, email messages. Most interesting information is stored in SQLite databases, which is just well, sort of automatically done by the uh, OS uh, API when you store data. Um, and SQLite databases don't really have a nice file format for carving. Uh, they have a specific header, they have a magic string in the header. You can look for that in raw data and say, okay, this is a, probably a starter of a, a SQLite database. But the SQLite databases don't have a nice footer. So you can't say with certainty, okay, this is the end of a file. And uh, even if they had it, uh, because of the high fragmentation of the YOFS file system, so each change, even if it's one byte in an SQLite database, is rewritten somewhere in a completely different part of the file system uh, of the YOFS image. So it's very hard for linear carving tools to just start, okay, this is the start of the file, and then you look for a footer which can be on the other end of the YOFS image. So you get a lot of garbage with that and very uh, little useful information. So uh, we need a smarter way to actually carve the data. Um, to carve for SQLite format, uh, SQLite database, it's important to understand the SQLite page. Now, very simply put, SQLite databases are stored in a balanced tree form. Um, so there's always a root page, and it has references to interior pages, and those pages have reference to other pages, and then at the bottom, we have the leaf pages. Now, the root page contains a magic value, so you can recognize a root page. Um, an SQLite page is, can have a size of 512 bytes to 64 kilobytes. Um, they will probably design SQLite pages to fit into a YOFS page, because that's, uh, that's more efficient. All the actual uh, data, all the records, of a SQLite database are stored in the leaf pages. So that's what we are looking for. We don't really care about the interior pages or the root page. We want the real data. Now, very simply, the format of a uh, SQLite leaf page is uh, you have a page header, and I will show that in detail later. Uh, you have a cell pointer array, which actually is just an array of offsets in that page where the cells, where the records are stored. So we can use that as a guideline to look in that page for where the records are. And you have the cell content area, which stores the actual uh, table records. So this is the pages. These are the pages we want to look for in our raw YOFS2 image. So the idea is we want to carve the SQLite data from a raw YOFS2 image on a record level. So we don't carve for the whole SQLite database file, because that appears to be too difficult. So we start carving for records of an SQLite database. And the nice thing in the process is we can get a lot of deleted previous history information from the YOFS2 file system if we do it correctly. So <clears throat> step one is to identify the SQLite leaf pages, right? So uh, we want to recognize in our YOFS2 raw image when a SQLite leaf page starts. Well, fortunately, the SQLite leaf page has a sort of recognizable header um, we know that the pages um, are uh, a, a multiple of, uh, you know the page size because it's set in the database header. So if you look at the, the database files in a reference phone model, you can see what, pa what page size is used. So knowing the page size, you can start looking at the boundaries of these page, page sizes. Uh, in this case, um, it was, uh, I guess, two kilobytes you can start looking at the boundaries of these pages uh, for the signature of a leaf page. So this is the format of a leaf page. You can see that uh, in the beginning, a leaf page is always identified by one byte, uh, which must have the value 13. Now, if you start looking to your image purely on the borders and on this, only this byte, then you get a lot of garbage because there's, there's going to be a lot of false positives. So we need more bytes to, um, well, to have a better algorithm for detecting the leaf pages. 
Well, there's also a byte uh, which tells you the byte offset into the page. Um, and we know that, that the value of that byte must be smaller than the page size. So we can check for that if the uh, second byte, the second two bytes, uh, make a value which is smaller than the page size, then it's more likely that this is a leaf page. And so we can do it with the rest of the bytes also. So you create a kind of heuristic to recognize a leaf page. If all those bytes match your criteria, then it's very likely that it's a leaf page. Okay, so we can now identify the leaf page, the SQLite leaf page. That's great. We can carve out the leaf page, and then we want to look for the records inside this leaf page, because that's what we're interested in. Now, there was a cell pointer array, which is actually just offsets into that page where the records are stored. For this example, we see that there's two records stored here. Uh, well, actually, two cells. Uh, uh, cell one is located at the offset 279, and the other at F1. Now, when we look into this page, you can now nicely carve out the cells from this page. This one has only two. You see the color in yellow and green. So for this page, we now carved out two cells which contain the records of the SQLite database. Now we have another challenge because we have an anonymous record. We have multiple anonymous records. We know that there's SQLite data in there, but we actually don't know to which database or table in the database it belongs. Because the SQLite schematic of the table or the database is not stored with the records, but it's stored somewhere at the beginning of the file. Now, if you look at the, um, the format, you see that there's a payload size, a row ID, this is usual in uh, database tables, then you have a section which defines the column types. So, for example, it says the first column is of type integer, the second is a string, the third is a string, the fourth is a blob, and etc. And then you have the actual column values. Now, the last two parts, the column types and the column values, together is called the record. That's the, interest, the information that's interesting for us. So then you want to, uh, now that you know the column ID, the, the, the types, you can actually match them against templates you create. So when you take a known uh, database file from an Android phone, for example, take the context database, you take a reference model and you look at the, the, the format of the table, you know which columns there are in the table and of which type they are. So that allows you to create a template. So this is one example from the calls file. Uh, we know the, the columns, how many columns, and we know the types of the columns. Now we can match all the records we found, the anonymous records, uh, records against this template, and actually categorize it into to which table it belongs. And we did that, and uh, that worked pretty well. Um, here's an example of what we recovered. You see here a nice uh, table of contact information. So the, the, the table above is the, the call log. So outgoing and the incoming calls. And the second table is the contact table. This table is more interesting because this is um, uh, actually the text message database. And what you see here is uh, when you look at the row IDs is that you see always multiple versions of the same row. Well, that's due to the Jeff's file system. So when you look at the example of uh, row 155, you see that he is sending it, he's creating a message, and the first status is a draft. Now, when you send the message, the status is changed to pending and then send. Uh, each time the status is changed in the SQLite record, the whole page, the whole Jeff's page, needs to be rewritten. So that's why we can see the history of what happened to that record. So you can see here when it was drafting his message, and you can see exactly when he actually sent the message. That's really nice. And what's more is when you look at the top messages, you see the text message package uploaded. Now, this was a text message that we saw is sent when the application on, uh, on the Swift Logic 2's phone, the malware, actually uploaded the zip file. It sent this text message with this format. So this actually connects the dots of this phone. And when you look through the, the SMS messages, you see that he's communicating with a certain uh, person. That's Mr. E. 
about that he has a sample and he wants more money. This is the browser history. This is also a nice example. The older versions of Android just stored your credentials in clear text in the SQLi database. That's, um, that's bad for the user, I think, but good for the forensic investigator because uh, he can use that information. Um, and at the bottom, you see um, the visits to the actual web server uh, where the PDF files were hosted. And the nice thing is that also here you can see due to the OFS file system, the version history. So you see the first records actually show he first visits the page and then that was one visit and then the next one you see the second visit. Normally when you look at the browser history, you would only see the last record that he had two visits. But now you can also see due to the version history that uh, his first visit was at 5.59 and his second visit was actually at 6.28. So this gave us a lot of information about what happened on the, on the phone. And you can see here that he searched on Twitter for, uh, on the, the SwiftLogic guy. So this method really helped us to actually, from a big blob of uh, uh, JOFS2 data, which cannot be reconstructed into a file system, to still get all the interesting information out of that on a really low level. Uh, this method is also applicable to your traditional um, hard drives. So uh, when you want, for example, to search in deleted data, instead of looking for whole SQLite database files, you can carve on records, which will get you even more data back than looking for the whole uh, SQLite database file. Well, that was actually um, um, what we needed to, to reconstruct the story other findings we had, which I didn't discuss today because of the time. Uh, there was a Facebook post from the SwiftLogic dude uh, in which he says, hey, tonight I'm going to pick up my new phone. That Facebook post was read by, uh, uh, by the dead guy. And he called to the phone store where the SwiftLogic guy was going to pick up the phone. Um, so it's likely that he you know, had a little chat with the phone store uh, manager and asked him to somehow install the package on the Swift Logic dude's phone. Um, there's a lot of communication between uh, the dead guy and a certain contact named Mr. E, in which he discusses that he has some results and that he wants more money. And they make an appointment, and well, the result is that he's, uh, he's dead. So, well, in a nutshell, uh, he bugged the phone, the dead guy bugged the phone of the SwiftLogic dude, and he got the sensitive data out of there, the schematics of SwiftLogic. The dead guy downloaded the schematics, had contact with Mr. E, said, hey, I have the stuff, I want more money, and Mr. E probably killed him. So that was, uh, that was basically the digital forensic research workshop challenge. If you want to read more, you can, it's all published. You can look it up. Um, it was a really cool challenge, so a lot of new aspects in there. Um, by now, the new phones don't have YOFS 2 anymore, but there are still a lot of phones out there with Android 2.2 or lower, so it's still actual now. Um, thank you uh, for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Ivo. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left for questions. I'm not sure if anyone has any questions they'd last, like to ask. Oh, all right. Thanks. Uh, you said the new phones use X4 and stuff. Uh, that goes to, uh, to a flash translation layer. Does that translation layer do some sort of history sort of stuff like the AFS2 for obviously flash performance? And can you get to that data and get history on that also? So I understood very little about oh, this. So, <laughs> so the new phones use X4, yeah, and they go through a flash sort of translation yeah. layer, and I presume that will have some kind of not rewriting to protect the flash, right? Again, so can you get the history still there? Um, yeah, the, uh, actually, that the goes for all the NAND flash file system. Is that um, uh, as long as the blocks are not flashed and data is changed, it's written to new pages, and the old version remains. Um, so uh, that the same goes for the new file system. 
but it um, depends on how it's implemented. If, um, for example, uh, I know of uh, operating systems that when you uh, actually rewrite a file or you delete a file, that the whole block is immediately wiped. So that would kind of destroy your, uh, your previous, uh, previous versions. But I, I don't know for sure how it is with the newer Android phones. I haven't really looked into that yet. Okay. Anyone else? Have a question? Yeah. Great talk. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. How, how does the forensic industry, the forensic laws, and uh, all the legal framework go along with let's say routing a device because does, does routing a device is a sound uh, forensic measure because I mean you root you actually can uh, taint the, the, the device and the evidence right, right? yeah that's, that's a good question because uh, they don't really like that in uh, well in the Netherlands it's not so much of a problem but uh, I believe in the United States that's much more of a problem if you change data on the device um, what we see with the newer routing techniques that it's possible to do a uh, <clears throat> well actually a temporary route which uh, only operates in the memory of the device so that's the nice thing you just temporary route the device then you acquire and you actually run your tools from the memory and you acquire the data from the partitions without changing anything uh, on the partitions you don't even change the system partition so the newer techniques are helping us with that yeah Okay, any other questions for you all? No. All right, well, Ivo, thank you very much again, and um, we'll be right back and set up the next speaker for you. So thank you. Thanks.